Hi, I'm Darren Pepper. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Hey everybody, welcome into episode 131 of the Leaning into Leadership podcast. My guest on the show today is Dr. Frederick Buskey. Now, if you don't know Frederick Buskey, I got to tell you about this guy. Frederick and I have actually built a really good relationship over the last year to maybe a year and a half. Um, as we share similar passions and similar focus, we're also part of a mastermind group together. Uh, but I'll tell you, the things you really need to know about Frederick are this guy is so passionate about supporting assistant principals, uh, so much so that he has a brand new book that just released, and that book is called A School Leader's Guide to Reclaiming Purpose. In that book, Dr. Buskey talks about six stages to reclaiming purpose, beginning with understanding urgent leadership, managing priorities instead of your time, powering down your to-do list, powering up your systems, leveraging small amounts of time, and being a strategic leader. Frederick and I sat down and had a conversation about leadership, about school leaders, and specifically about assistant principals. It's really a fantastic conversation, folks, and I can't wait for you to hear it. You're going to get the whole thing right after this. Are you a school or district leader looking to unlock the full potential of your team? Do you dream of a cohesive, empowered staff all marching to the same beat? Well, then look no further. Introducing the ultimate solutions, high-performance leadership teams from Road to Awesome, our two-day leadership retreat designed exclusively for school and district leaders like you. And picture this, a tranquil setting, away from the hustle and bustle, away from the email, away from the phone calls and the constant interruptions. Over the course of two transformative days, you and your fellow leaders strategize, collaborate and align your visions. You dive deep into discussions, workshops, and team building activities, all geared towards one common goal, unleashing the collective power of your leadership team. But this isn't just any retreat. It's a dynamic, hands-on experience crafted by experts in education and leadership development. You'll walk away with practical tools, actionable strategies, and a renewed sense of purpose to tackle any challenge that comes your way. Imagine the impact of having your entire leadership team on the same page, working effectively and efficiently towards a shared vision. With our retreat, that dream becomes a reality. So if you're ready to revolutionize your leadership approach, inspire your team, and drive real results in your school, don't miss out on this opportunity. Reach out now to start planning your two-day leadership retreat and take the first steps towards transforming your school for the better. Visit roadtoawesome.net or email me at darren at roadtoawesome.net to set up a free consultation and launch your team into a successful year. Your journey towards exceptional leadership, your journey on the road to awesome starts right here. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get on to the episode. As many of you know, my leadership career, uh, formal leadership career, began with me being an assistant principal. And I actually had the opportunity to be an assistant principal in a couple of different roles. And certainly it was interesting to learn the different roles and responsibilities that go into being an assistant principal. But for most of us, that assistant principal role is simply a stepping stone. It's the, I have to do this in order to become the building principal or move to the district level or whatever it is that my career goal might be. But the assistant principal role, man, it is so important and it is so critical not only to successful student outcomes, but to the culture of your school, to morale within the building, and so many other things. And today, my guest on the show is Frederick Buskey, and we are going to talk 
about the assistant principal role, about ways that assistant principals can find their own space where they can create some autonomy and where they can actually find some joy and excitement in that job. So Frederick, thank you so much for joining me here on Leaning Into Leadership. Darren, I'm so excited. We've been trying to do this for a while, so it's great to be together with you. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Uh, we have been talking about this for quite some time, and you know the timing of this one actually is really good. You've got a brand new book that is being released on March tenth. Uh, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. You've got some really cool coursework that you're doing to support assistant principals around the country. Uh, but before we get to all of that stuff, maybe um, I don't know, jump in the time machine, take us back a little bit, and walk us through a little bit of the career of Frederick Buskey. Yeah, so I was in K-12 for 17 years and I started out in physical education, taught special education and then uh, middle school history, which was probably the job that I've loved the most. And then moved to a rural county office and was a special educator. So I always like to point out, I have never been an assistant principal and I've never been a principal. But what I've done is to use that to my advantage because I have soaked up everything I've learned from all these other assistant principals and principals in the field. It's been kind of nice because I've never been able to say, oh, well, back when I did that job, right? So I've just listened and listened to everybody that I've worked with. In 2006, I finished up my doctoral work and came to Western Carolina University where we had an online principal program. but I was able to go all over the state, visiting interns and getting into buildings. And then in 2013, I moved down to Clemson University and just was really privileged to be very immersed in the field, out in schools, having conversations with superintendents and principals and assistant principals. And you know, there's a story I'll share later that really explains why I'm doing the work that I'm doing related to assistant principals. Yeah, that's excellent. And, you know, I, I really appreciate, uh, I mean, we've known each other for a while now, and I really appreciate that you are putting that focus on the assistant principal, because I feel like, you know, especially upon reflection, you know, so much of the professional development that I received, both as an assistant principal and as a principal, was really more geared towards knowing what was expected of our teachers so that we could evaluate, hold accountable, support, coach in different initiatives, but very little about how to be a better assistant principal or how to be a better principal. Um, I know it's honestly the reason both of you, uh, both you and I are in this space is to provide that support that that not, hasn't necessarily existed or been a big focus when when you decided to jump into this work let's let's maybe take that just a little bit further um so from the university level to now now doing this on your own as an entrepreneur what are some of the things that that drove you to say hey i want to i want to take this a step further and do more to support specifically assistant principals when i came to western carolina i worked for just a wonderful mentor uh, dr jackie jacobs and one of the things she reminded me of right off the bat, she said, you know, we're, we're a principal licensure program, but we're preparing people to be assistant principals, right? So there's this kind of tension, I think, in all the admin programs, you're licensing people for the principalship, but in most places, they're not going straight into principalship. They're going to the assistant principalship. So trying to get that piece right is a challenge. And then being fortunate enough to be a supervisor of interns and being in so many buildings, working with my students, getting ready to step into those assistant principal roles, and then being able to talk to the ones that had matriculated into there. I just kept hearing stories over and over again about how busy, we all know that it's busy and it's crazy, but then the the challenge in taking care of themselves. And for many of them, the kind of sadness in that they got in because they wanted to make a difference with kids and a difference with teachers as instructional leaders, 
but they just kept getting pigeonholed to get pulled into tasks and not able to move forward. And at the same time, you're then hearing from district leaders saying, hey, we don't have a good principal pipeline. If you don't have a good principal pipeline, it means you're not developing your assistant principals. So I just, I looked at that space and I thought, wow, this is, this is, this is a tragedy, right? Because we have so many passionate assistant principals that are working so hard. And so I really looked at the people that were being very successful and looked at the people that were struggling and started to really focus on how do we close that gap? I think that's, that's just so critical. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, I, I think, man, there's so many pieces in there that I want to unpack a little bit further. Um, let's, let's go first to, and, and who knows whether we'll make it back to the other ones, but, but let's go first here with, uh, something that you said in there, if your principal pipeline is, is running thin, you're not doing a good enough job to develop your assistant principles. Let's, let's go a little further with that. The story that, that really kind of pushed me out of the door of higher education, uh, I, was, I was looking at that transition and then I had this experience and I just thought, okay, I, I got to go do something. So I was in a rural school in South Carolina, elementary school. It's April. I, I walk in, I go into the assistant principal's office and, you know, as soon as you walk in, I, I knew something was wrong. Her face is red, her hair is all out of place, there's papers all over the desk, and you can just see the tension. And I said, Kelly, what's wrong? And she looks up and she picks up this stack of yellow papers and she waves them and she said, it is 10 o'clock in the morning. I have seven office referrals. Each one of these is going to take me 45 minutes. I'm never going to get out of here. I thought I was going to get into classrooms. I have teachers I wanted to work with and I'm just going to be stuck in here all day. She was, she was close to tears. And I asked her, Kelly, of those seven office referrals, how many of those are more about the teacher than about the student? And she thought, just a moment. She said five. It was five teachers. If I could get in and work with them a little bit, we wouldn't have this problem. And I left that school and sat in my car in a parking lot and just thought, because Kelly, she'd been in for, th I think, three to five years. So she'd had some experience. She, she was really dialed in, wanted to be an instructional leader. She knew that she was in this cycle, but she didn't know how to get out. And so that's, that's the piece that has just kind of become my obsession, right? How do we move from this idea of being caught as urgent leaders where we're focused on tasks, we're focused on urgency, we're treating symptoms, and, and then we kind of confuse action for progress. How do we move the, from that urgency to them becoming more strategic leaders where we're driven by purpose, we're focused on people, we look at how we uncover problems instead of just treating the symptoms and then invest in incremental change to continually make progress. I think that's just really interesting because I, you know, I'm, I, I want to push even further on that because I think sometimes the belief, and I'll be honest with you, my, my first role as an assistant principal, two years, high school discipline and attendance. So, you know, your, your story about Kelly definitely resonates. Um, maybe I would get into some classrooms on a Friday afternoon, but for the most part, it was, you know, from the word go, it's just discipline referral after referral after referral. I think there's a, I don't know if it's a belief, if it's a practice, or if it's viewed as a rite of passage, that as an assistant principal, you're task driven. Now, you're, you're pushing in a direction here where not necessarily true that you need to be task driven as an assistant principal. And I'll preface this by saying, I'm not disagreeing with you. I agree with you 100 percent. But I do think there's this belief um, that as the assistant principal, whether that's that's the assistant principal that holds that belief or it's the principal because that's what they did or the system just inherently I'm dumping everything on you as the principal that I don't want to do or that is a time suck 
for me so I can go be an instructional leader. Um, talk a little bit more about that. Is that is that something common that you see or is that just something I'm seeing? Yeah, and it's this combination of things. So first, you're exactly right. The assistant principal tends to be in that space where they are the task person and, and that's by necessity, right? So there's that piece of it, but then there's also what happens. I think a lot of people get into the assistant principalship and they have that servant's heart. So they want to support teachers. And so we think the way we support teachers is by doing things for them. So not only do I already have this task orientation and all these things that come right with the job, but now I'm going around and I'm talking to all my teachers and I'm thinking about, okay, what can I do to make their lives easier? And so now I'm adding more tasks to my plate. And the trade-off on that is that when I'm doing stuff for teachers, I'm not able to work with teachers, right? And, and so I like to use the Eisenhower matrix to really start to visualize this. So it's the matrix that talks about important and urgent. So the top left-hand quadrant, quadrant one, is important and urgent. The second top quadrant on the right side is important but not urgent. And then the third quadrant, which is on the lower left, is urgent but not important. So what I see happen over and over again is we get into that quadrant one, right? That's urgent. That's the stuff that it's about safety. It's about meeting your your legislative and your uh, obligations to make sure that you're running your school the way it needs to be. We start in quadrant one, but we get caught in urgency because urgency creates this motion. It puts us in mode where we're just reacting all the time. And so everything becomes a fire. Every time there's a fire, we jump up, we have to you know drop everything and go take care of that. And so what we, we wind up being driven by urgency. So we're doing work in quadrants one where we need to be, but then we're also doing work in quadrant three. Quadrant two, that important but not urgent, that's where we grow our teachers. That's where we support our teachers. And so I think of the assistant principalship of the, as the challenge of doing a little bit less of quadrant three and being able to wade into quadrant two. So I've got to learn how to not be driven by urgency, but to be driven by what's important, what's purposeful. And to me, that's people, right? And that's why most of us got into this because we're passionate about people. So how do I stop reacting and become a little bit more intentional so that I can get in and I can help grow teachers? Uh, yeah, you're, you're, man, you're just like singing my song right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the two, two pieces that I talk about all the time with leaders when, when I'm coaching them or even when we're just first starting out is number one, gaining that clarity about what's really important. And number two, how can you be intentional to go and do that work without getting yourself stuck in that firefighter world? Because that is especially the AP role, man, you can get you can get to the point where that's all you do is put out fires and not not every assistant principal is in a position to to truly be in a leadership role you know i, I mentioned my first role my second role i was in charge of curriculum and instruction in my building I, most of my work was focusing on the important i wasn't focused a whole lot on urgent um you know when you're when you're in charge of, you know, the the state assessments, and you're in charge of developing professional development and uh, master scheduling, none of that seems urgent. It's important, and and for me, I think it was a really good opportunity to learn how to prioritize my time. Um, but, you know, when when you're in that rapidly evolving world that involves student discipline, um, I think that that certainly can push you you know, into that, into that firefighter world a whole lot more. I, I'm curious, you talked, you talked a little bit about um, the, the story with the individual assistant principal who five of the seven discipline referrals, if, if more support could happen with the teacher, that maybe those issues would stop happening. How, what are some, some steps that you recommend for assistant principals to support teachers in areas of need, whether that's classroom management or maybe it's lesson design or 
uh, time management. I mean, it could be a lot of different things that could lead to a teacher, you know, getting frustrated and taking their frustrations out on a student leading to a discipline referral. So maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I tend to think of the, the journey from urgent to strategic as being a journey. So it's a set of stages. I, I can give an assistant principal all kinds of great strategies for working with teachers, but if you never get in the classroom, right, then those strategies are wasted. So, I mean, that's actually how I started out my consulting is developing all this stuff that I thought it was great stuff on how you can help teachers and APs kept looking at me and saying, like, yeah, that's great if I could get right. in there. And, and so that's what I decided to do in the end was to just focus on what's the journey? How do I get, how do I help assistant principals move from being stuck in urgent to being able to get in the classroom. And we know the nature of it, especially the assistant principal, you're not gonna have hours every day to be in classrooms. That's not the promise, right? The promise is maybe you can get into a classroom for five minutes here and five minutes there because, because of the demands on your role. And I work largely with rural school assistant principals, so they're wearing every hat. There is not an assistant principal of discipline. There's not an assistant principal of curriculum. Like they're they're doing it all. So it's a journey. And I think the first journey, the first stage of that journey is understanding where you are, understanding that you're in that urgent zone and understanding how, how did you get there and why is it so hard to break out, right? And, and part of that, the big thing to me is, again, we focus on the urgent things, and we're task focused and then we think we can manage our way out of it if we just worked a little bit harder if we just managed our time a little bit better we could get out but that that's not the that's not it because there's always going to be more to do than you can actually do especially if you're focusing on things that are urgent as opposed to important so i always say the first big step of getting out of the urgent zone is moving from the idea that you're managing your time to the idea that you have to manage your priorities. I think that's huge right there. Um, and that's, it's interesting. I mean, you and I've had this conversation on multiple levels about, you know, managing priorities versus um, just, yeah, managing your time. Uh, certainly something that I still, uh, even to this day, I struggle with at times. Um, uh, even with with good calendar blocking, you know, strategies and that kind of stuff, there are still those moments where I can feel a little bit overwhelmed. So certainly, assistant principals are are going to feel that way. Building principals, uh, I mean, anybody in a leadership role, can find themselves kind of going with the ebb and flow of being, you know, maybe feeling like you're you're on top of it at points in time, and then also at points in time where you know uh, the analogy I like to use is breathing through a snorkel. Mm -hmm. And as an AP, you can breathe through the snorkel a whole lot if you allow yourself uh, to do that. So let's let's maybe shift just a little bit here. Um, and, and let's talk about the work you're doing um, in, in some, some really, really great ways to support um, assistant principals. And, and specifically, I'm curious, I know you've got some coursework that you've put together um, talk a little bit about kind of where you've, where you've chosen to go with that and some things that the assistant principals can benefit from by maybe taking a course or two um, to help them get focused. Yeah, so my, my big course project right now is kind of a, a series or a whole set of courses built around the idea of building a positive classroom culture. And it's really a marriage between my passion of working with beginning teachers and that passion for working with assistant principals. And I think a couple things that are unique about it. One is I take that approach that it is classroom culture, right? It's relationships, management, and then safety. And, and how we deal with each one of those goes into creating that positive classroom culture. And one of the things that I just heard over and over again is like an assistant principal talking about a teacher that's struggling and the AP will say, yeah, I've, I've get them, given them materials and talked to them about implementing classroom procedures and they're not doing it. There's some very technical things that we can do to support teachers who are struggling to implement classroom procedures. 
But, but again, they're technical and there's some tools that we can apply to help take people through that. A lot of assistant principals have never been trained in that. They've maybe had some real basics and maybe they're part of the reason they're an assistant principal is because they were good at classroom management, but it's just something they did naturally. They didn't have to work at it and really right, assess it and break it down. So my idea with these courses is that I'm developing courses for teachers that show them that break things down into steps and into frameworks, because that's another one of our challenges, right? We have all these process pieces, but remembering them is hard. So I really love visual frameworks. So I'm helping teachers to do that work and then also developing courses for assistant principals and principals that go right along with it. So if we're doing a video or a course for teachers on how you use instructional praise to reinforce procedures, how you use instructional praise to help support students that are actually struggling with implementing those procedures. So how you, how you can get them help without making it any kind of a conflict situation. If I have a course on that for teachers, I have a corresponding course for assistant principals and principals to be able to look at, okay, how do I actually go in then and have that conversation with that teacher about instructional praise? How do I help them implement that? How do I do that data collection? What's a really simple technique that I can use that then we can feed back to the teacher and help them do that. So that's the piece that I'm really super excited about because if we're, imagine if we're assistant principals, principals and teachers, and we're all thinking about building relationships, we're thinking about managing the classroom, we're thinking about responding to safety events, we're all using the framework, same frameworks, we're thinking about it in the same way and we have the same language. Like it just seems that that makes that just makes everything so much easier. It absolutely does. I mean, you know, so often, I mean, you think about, you know, different curricula that we might be using in, in a classroom or, you know, a reading curriculum or, you know, a math curriculum or something. The idea, a big part of that is to build that common vernacular through the process. So, so that a student is, uh, let's use a math curriculum, a student is spiraling through this particular math curriculum from grade two, three, four, five, or whatever, maybe at the, at the secondary level with building that classroom culture, with having, you know, consistent language around procedures, around, you know, outcomes, around redirection, I mean, all of that kind of stuff. And, and, I, and I love how you're going at this, where it isn't just simply, hey, teachers, here's what you need, because this circles back to what I said when we kind of kicked it off. Now, here, principal, assistant principal, here's how you can do this. Here's what your look for's are. This is how you can support and coach this. Because to me, that was a big gap in professional learning that first handful of years that I was, you know, a, a, a pr assistant principal. And then, and ultimately even my first year or so as a principal before, before I had an opportunity to work with a leadership coach. Um, I just think that is really, really impactful. What are some of the things that you're hearing? What's some of the feedback that people are sharing with you that, that have gone through and done some of the work with the courses? At this point, I, this, is, this is a pretty new program for us. So most of the feedback I've gotten right now are from, um, from some of the newer teachers that I'm working with. So for them making the whole procedures piece transparent and getting them thinking more, especially for high school teachers, about investing in those relationships on the front end. I was working with an intern teacher and he was the first time we worked together, he's talking about how just students aren't really respecting him and he's having trouble getting them to, to manage them. And we just talked about a few really simple strategies for building relationships because, and, and he's a band teacher. So he's got all these kids cycling through his room, you know, every, all during the day. And we just talked about the, the beginnings of relationships, which is recognizing people, seeing people and touching base with them. And he came back and talked about how much difference that had made. And, and I think about if we had had his principal assistant principal in the room as well, right? Then how much easier is that for them to remind him and support him in that? I've got a group of principals that have just gone through the foundations course 
and now they're wanting to bring their teacher leaders through that. So we're going to phase this in with mentor teachers and experienced teachers starting to take the foundations and take these courses to develop that language so that now as we bring the new teachers in to take the courses, they're already going to have supports. They're going to have supports at the admin level and they're going to have supports then at that teacher level as well. So, so we're phasing that in at this point. I think that's fantastic. You know, and as, as somebody who is teaching, you know, uh, graduate level students, you know, second career educators um, in, in a classroom management course myself, I think that what you're talking about, what you're hitting on is just so critical. And I love that you're going at the relationship piece. I think, you know, so often when we onboard new teachers or for that matter, we onboard new leaders to our school, we might talk about procedures that we have within our school. We might talk about expectations with curriculum. We might talk about expectations with well, whether it's assessment or a curriculum map or, you know, some of those types of things. But we probably don't spend the time talking about the importance of building relationships and helping to prepare, especially early career educators, on how you go about doing that. Uh, that's been an interesting takeaway for me with uh, with the course that I'm teaching that many of them are reflecting and sharing back, you know, I guess I hadn't thought too much about the relationship piece that it just happens naturally. And, but when we're intentional about building those relationships, I mean, you talked about just those touching base strategies, just the, you know, I've been talking with my group quite a bit about just greeting kids at the door, you know, just being able to get a little bit of a temperature check of, you know, how is each kid when they're coming into the room, you know, whether that's for a whole day or you have them, you know, multiple groups of kids, like you've mentioned, the band director. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, talk to us a little bit more. What, what are some things that you love to share with people about um, strategies for really leaning in and building those relationships? Well, I think it's, it's funny what you just said about how fundamental relationships are. And yet, I know for me, always focused on the management. I was, I was fortunate enough to go through multiple classroom management programs that were really intense and each one kind of came from a slightly different angle and and so i've drawn heavily on that work and i used to really emphasize classroom management and and when you say classroom management like everybody jumps on that right teachers are like yeah i need that and right. and, and admin wants that but i used to always start my my things with my presentations with it's a pyramid and relationships are the most important thing. And then there's management and there's just discipline and we're going to jump into management and discipline. And one time it just hit me between the eyes. Like I keep saying relationships is the most <laughs> important, but I don't, we don't do that. And then jump over it. Yeah. yeah. And Darren, I was not one of those teachers that was instantly great at relationships. Like I loved my kids. I was passionate, but I was really intense and if kids couldn't adapt to my intensity, I wasn't good at reaching out and figuring, you know, how to bring them along. My wife is an amazing teacher. She walks in a classroom and in 10 minutes, she's got relationships with all those kids. I had to work at it and it took me a long time to learn to really appreciate kids. And, and so I think what you just said about being there to check in, to make sure that I think if every kid comes into your classroom and they know that you saw them and they know that they that you care about them, and you know your they you know their name. I, that's big. When you especially when you think about high school, middle school, moving multiple classrooms, there are kids that go through the whole day and nobody ever said their name. Yeah. Nobody ever looked at them, and so that that basic strategy of just welcoming kids into your classroom and seeing them is is absolutely essential and in doing that once we're doing that and we start to learn our kids we're going to see the kids that are in trouble we're going to see that and at this point when i see you have come in and you are not in great shape and i know a little bit about your situation as a teacher now i can be proactive i don't have to be reactive yeah. and then wonder at the end of class why you blew up and why, why you got frustrated and didn't do what i wanted you to do if I can catch you early and I know the signs, I can be proactive and support you to be successful so we're, we're not winding up in that conflict situation. 
Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's that's just such an important piece. And you know, I I talk frequently about both the art and the science of being an educator. And I think there's so much of that that is the art of that. It's just making that human connection, being able to, you know, just have a feel for, you know, where each of your students are as they come into the room. And, you know, in some cases it's, it's very overt. They'll tell you in some cases, you know, as you get to know them, you just understand from kind of the feel of them coming in the room. And I love that you talked about being, you talked about being proactive there. I think it's just such a huge piece when it comes to classroom management and, and just leading a classroom. Um, is is having those relationships and being able to understand where everybody is. Um, let, let's do this as we're our time is starting to wind down. I want to talk a little bit about the book before I get to my last question here on the podcast. So, the the new book, like I said, is coming out March tenth. A school leader's guide to reclaiming purpose. Share with us just a little bit. Um, you know what are what are we going to find in this book, and what was kind of your motivation for writing it? So I wrote that book to help Kelly get to the place where she was working with those teachers who were sending those five referrals so that she could get to the place where those referrals were not coming in the office. So I specifically wrote the book for her. And I I imagine that process is that five stage journey, right? First one is figure out where you're at, why you're in that urgent zone. The second thing then is learning how to whittle some things off your list, learning to not jump into all those urgent things at the, at the bottom. So I call that kind of powering down. And then the third stage is powering up. And that is realizing that, you know, I can't do this alone. So we have to have conversations as a school leadership team. I have to have conversations with my teachers about what the priorities really are, how I can best serve them. And we've started we need to start to develop systems that are going to make our work go a little bit more smoothly. So I power down and then I power up with these systems and developing common language and expectations with people. And then I can start to reinvest the few minutes I'm saving each day. And again, it's not like, oh yeah, I'm just going to drop all these tasks off and I'm going to have hours to be in the classroom. That's not the reality. But if I can let go of one or two small things and I can reclaim 10 minutes in my day, I can take those 10 minutes and I can reinvest that in teachers. And so one of the parts of the guide that I'm proudest about is how we can take short, small increments of time and actually leverage those into powerful practices that help teachers grow and that give us the that connect us back to that sense of purpose. And then I end the book with what it means to be a strategic leader, you know, how we get purpose focused, how we can start thinking about instead of treating symptoms, we can start pausing and some simple techniques for uncovering the underlying problems and driving incremental change. And then really remaining in the midst of all that we have to do, remaining a people focused leader. Some excellent stuff right there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm most of the way through the book right now. Of course, I was fortunate enough to get an advanced copy of that book and uh, really, really enjoying it. It's extremely well put together and very well thought out. Um, so let's do this. We're definitely at that point um, in the show where I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody who comes here onto the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. So, Frederick, tell me, what are you doing to lean into leadership right now? So I think there's two big things. I'm a big one word fan. So my one word for leadership right now is grace. And there's three parts of that for me. One is just moving gracefully, which reminds me to slow down and be intentional. Second piece is giving others grace. And then the third one is giving myself grace. And honestly, that's probably the hardest one. The other thing that I'm trying to do, and you and I were talking about this earlier today, there's so many opportunities. We have, there's so much need and we have so much opportunity to serve and to help create better conditions for people. And I sometimes get caught in the mindset of, I have all of this stuff to do and I need to grind in order to do all this stuff. So I'm really working hard on 
making sure that it is not stuff to do. These are opportunities I have. And as such, I should be moving through them with a joyful appreciation that I have these opportunities. I'll get the same amount of stuff done, but I'll have a lot more fun and probably do work that's more authentic if I can carry that idea of enjoying being able to have these opportunities to serve people versus trying to grind stuff out. That's just so well said. I, I love that philosophy right there. It's, uh, it is very true. You know, the work that, that you do, the work that I do, the space that we, that we are both in together, um, man, it's just tons of opportunity to really support and help others. Uh, you've heard me say the quote, I've said it here on the show several times, but we are uniquely positioned to help the person that we once were. And, you know, being able to make those connections to support people and, and then to see them succeed, you know, and, and just know you had a tiny little part in that. It goes back to still being an educator, you know, in, in many, many ways, we're still educators. They're just, our classroom isn't necessarily, you know, eight-year-olds or, or middle school students or high school students there we're we're filled in classrooms with with adults yeah. that we're helping make an impact on kids i just i love that so very much folks make sure you grab a copy of the book we will have a link down in the show notes for you um, again, the book released on March 10th, which was just a few days ago. So make sure that uh, you grab a copy of that book. Um, Frederick, at this point, let's just really quick. People are going to want to check things out. They're going to want to look at those courses. Uh, I mentioned we'll put the book in the show notes. Uh, we'll put the links to the courses in there too. But how do people get in touch with you? Oh, and don't forget to mention your podcast. I have forgotten to mention your podcast until just now, but don't forget to mention your podcast. Oh, the podcast is so much fun. So my podcast is the assistant principal podcast. I think it's still the only active prin assistant principal podcast out there. And that's of course on Apple, Spotify and all that stuff. The easiest place to find all my stuff is at frederickbusky.com. But Darren, I really love hearing from people. I mean, you know, this can be isolating work and we're better when we're interacting with people. So I love for people to email me and they can do that at frederick at frederickbusky.com or catch me on LinkedIn. That's the one social media platform that I invest in. And you know, I've made a lot of good friends over there and you know, you're just like me. If somebody emails or somebody reaches out on LinkedIn, we will respond, we'll engage. And um, yeah. so it's just so, so critical. Yeah, absolutely. Well, man, this has been so much fun. I'm so glad we finally got the opportunity to make this happen. Um, congratulations on the book. Um, I am certain that that's going to make a huge impact on a lot of people. So thank you for joining me here on Leaning Into Leadership. Uh, you're welcome, Darren. It's been a blast. Man, what a fantastic episode. I really appreciate Frederick Buskey coming on to the show and sharing all of those incredible bits of wisdom. Folks, you'll find all of his information down there in the show notes. Make sure you go check it out. Make sure you follow Frederick Buskey. And now it's time for a pep talk. This week on the pep talk, I want to issue a challenge. I want to give you something to really think about. You know, as school leaders, we talk about community engagement quite frequently. And what are some ways for us to really get our community involved? How do we really do a good job of telling the story of our school? And how can we take our focus, our vision, our priorities, and make them something everybody understands and can take ownership with? Well, I will tell you years ago, one of the uh, great opportunities I had as a superintendent was to go through a strategic uh, planning process. And we came away with what we focused on as a culture of excellence. And part of creating our culture of excellence was to celebrate things that were excellent in our district. And we did this with one particular evening titled Our Celebration of Excellence. It was an entire evening, a showcase of student work, a showcase of our teachers, a showcase of everybody who was involved in our district. We, we recognized and announced our teacher of the year that night. Um, just a really wonderful, wonderful experience and wonderful opportunity. So my challenge for you this week is this. 
think about or enhance something you're currently doing that gives you an opportunity to celebrate excellence or awesomeness or whatever it is that you are chasing in your district. Make sure that you're doing something to include the community, your students, and your staff all together at once. And let me know about it. I want you to share some of those things. You know, right now in March, this is the time to start planning for that. You want to have those celebrations where you're chasing greatness. Shout out to my friend Don Epps in May, right? You want to have those in early May, mid-May, maybe even at the end of May. Now is the time to be planning for those. So that's your challenge. Come up with something that you can do to celebrate the work that you're looking for in your school. Get your community, get your students, get your teachers involved. And then share it out. Tag me on social media. I want to hear all about it. Folks, the best one we hear, maybe we can even get that person to come on the podcast and share with us the work that they did. That's what I've got for you this week, folks. Get out there and have a road to awesome week. Thank you for listening to the Leaning into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.